scenes and also Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the afternoon session. This is the computational photography uh, oral session. We have three orals and 13 spotlights. If you're one of the spotlight speakers, please come and sit in the first two rows. Um, if you aren't here already, look up your number. There are sort of numbers written on the chairs. Please uh, come and sit down. Sorry. Find your spotlight number and yeah. Um, OK, so, uh, so hi, I'm Ayan Chakrabarti. I'm one of the session chairs. I'm chairing the session with Mohit Gupta. Uh, as I said, we'll first have three orals. These will be uh, 12 minutes long, followed by three minutes for questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please come up to one of the mics. So there are two mics at the front of the room. Uh, please come up to either of them. And I guess we are ready to get started. OK, so the first talk is titled Illumined Spectra Based Source Separation Using Flash Photography. And the talk's going to be given by Harry Hu. Thanks for the introduction. Today, I would like to talk about flash photography technique in solving lighting separation problem. To begin with, let's first look at what the problem we would like to solve. And let's look at this example. The scene shown here is illuminated by two light sources, one from the left with light blue color and one from top with warm color. As we have observed, the illumination in the scene 
is mixed smoothly and is spatially varied. This produces big challenges for most of the vision and graphic tasks. So it's desirable to separate the photograph we have observed to multiple images, each under a single illuminant color. Clearly, this is a very challenging problem. But what are the challenges we need to address? To answer that, we first need to know how the image is produced. The image, the image intensity for the scene and the single illuminant, it does not only rely on the instant illumination spectra, but also the local geometry of the scene, as well as the reflectance spectra of the object we have observed. In addition, we also need to account for the camera spectral response for the camera we have used to capture the photograph. Combine them together, the intensity we have measured is an integral over illumination, shading, reflectance, and camera response. For the scene with multiple light sources, the image formation becomes more complex since the illumination here is spatially varying. At each point, we can represent the illumination as a linear combination with respect to the shading and illuminant spectra in the scene. Given this, let's get back to the problem we would like to solve. Our goal here is to find the image corresponds to the shading and illuminant colors for the no-flash image. So what are the unknowns we need to address under the problem set up? Let's get back to the image formation. First, we need to figure out the reflectance of the scene. And we also need to solve for the illuminant spectra of each light source, as well as the shading induced by them. And in this work, we assume that we have the knowledge of the camera response. So how many unknowns do we need to solve at each pixel? We have three for the reflectance. And for each light source, we have three for the illuminant colors and one for the shading. The number three is obtained here by using the low dimensional representation for the reflectance and illumination. To solve all of these unknowns at each pixel, it requires both highly underdetermined system as well as the multilinear optimization. So can we fix some unknowns here to simplify the estimation? We do this by taking an actual image under the flashlight. The idea here is the pair of flash and no flash images can provide the scene and a single illuminant, that is a flashlight. Recall that the intensity we have measured for the scene and a single illuminant can be written as follows. Now, if we have the knowledge of the illumination spectra for the flashlight, we can solve for the reflectance up to a per pixel scale, which is the shading induced by the flashlight. And we can normalize these two terms to get normalized reflectance. So from the pure flash, we are able to solve for the normalized reflectance. At this stage, we have the knowledge of the camera response. And we can also get rid of the reflectance effect in the image formation model. So the next problem is how to identify the illuminant colors and the relative shadings from the remaining term. To see that, we can divide normalized reflectance from the no-flash image. And here, we get a result, and we name it as a gamma image. It has the following properties. First, the value of each pixel solely depends on the shading and the illuminant colors of the scene. And the value is in the unit norm. For each pixel, we can represent it using the following form, where alpha and beta are the shading-related term and L1 and L2 denote the illuminant colors in the scene. Now, let's take a closer look at this equation. We know that the alpha and the beta are not negative at each pixel, and the value of each point are in the unit norm. So if we pick a point from this image, it lines on a sphere. And if we draw all the pixels in this image, it naturally forms a curve on the sphere where its ending points denotes as L1 and L2. This is because all the pixels in the gamma image can be formulated with a linear relationship with respect to the illuminant, illuminant colors. If we are able to figure out the ending points, 
We can also solve for the alpha and the beta via linear combination. And in this way, we are able to solve for the lighting separation problem. But what about scenes with different number of light sources? Let's look at this. The scene shown here is illuminated with three light, source, light sources with different colors. Here, we observe similar relationship. We find a triangle shape on the sphere with three corners denoting different light colors in the scene. And to see it more clearly, we can visualize the scene with respect to the different number of light colors. As expected, the corners of the shape increases with the number of the light colors in the scene. So, can we apply our method to all of these cases? Say, how about the scene with arbitrary number of light colors? So, we should make discussions of the proposed technique. Our technique is able to identify the light source only if its light color is not in the linear span of the other light colors. For instance, the yellow point cannot be identified as a light source since it can be represented by using the light colors from the other light sources. Second, we are able to estimate illuminant colors, but only up to the three for most common RGB cameras. For instance, for the scene with more than three light sources, as shown here, the yellow point cannot be identified with a unique combination where three bases. And finally, for every light source, there is a need for pixels purely illuminated by it. From this, we are able to locate the corner on the sphere to identify the color of the illuminant. So, next, let's make some brief summary of what we have done so far. Given the input flash and the no flash image pair, we first compute the pure flash. And from that, we are able to solve for the normalized reflectance. We take it back to the no flash, and we find gamma image. Given the gamma image, we design specific algorithm to find the ending points. And given that, we use them to find the per pixel relative shadings denoted by alpha and beta. So in this way, we are able to separate image. Next, let's look at the performance of the proposed technique on some real life scenes. The scene shown here is illuminated by the outdoor lights through the window from left and the right with light blue colors. And we also have the indoor lights from top with warm color. Our method is able to separate these light sources. As we can see from the separated image, which is appear as warm color. And we can also see these kind of cast shadows on the side wall as well as those on the back wall. And we can also see the highlights on the small table. This is correspond to the manner of the in indoor light source. And for the other separated image, we can observe for the shadows on the side of the couch as well as those on the small table. So let me flip back these two images so we can clearly see the variations in these two images. And our proposed method can accurately capture these attributes of the light sources. And for this scene, which is illuminated by three light sources, one is from the top left with light blue color, and one is from the bottom left with green color. And we also have the third light from top with the warm color. The scene is a bit complicated since it involves the glass object, which introduces the interreflections effects. Also, this scene contains specular objects. Well, we can now tell the lighting distributions from the no flash image. By using the proposed technique, we can have the separated image and return good performance. As we can have seen in these shadows, the separated image, the lead shadows tell us the positions of the corresponding light source, which exactly match the illumination setup for this scene. Next, let's look at an example for the outdoor scene. For this scene, we have an outdoor illuminant from the left with the warm color, and we also have the skylight from all directions. Our method is able to separate effects caused by the outdoor illuminance 
as we can see from these near polars as well as those highlights on the back of the chair. Also, the shadows on the small table. For the skylights, we expect there should be no shadows since the skylight is area source. And this is the result returned by using the proposed method from here, which is exactly match what we have expected for the manner of the skylight. And here, from these two images, we also observe some artifacts in the far end of the scene. This is because the pure flash is not strong enough to affect those regions, which has been indicated in the pure flash image. And the proposed method can also bring benefits to numerous applications. First, we are able to achieve post-capture light editing. This is the original no-flash image, and these are the separated images. We can simply operate, operate on each separated image and locally adjust the light colors. And compared with the parse techniques based on the global color transform, we can enable the local color editing, which has been long considered as a very challenging job for, even for the users with expertise. And we can see from this is the editing resource and this is original no flash. We can see the local regions, only the red flash has been edited. And here is another scene. And for this scene, sometimes we would like to remove some undesirable effects caused by the light source. And these are separated image. Here we note that there are some halo effects caused by the indoor lights. And simply by adjust the light colors, we can remove that kind of effects. And another interesting application for the proposed technique is for the outdoor scenario to separate the sun with the skylight. And here is a time lapse video. We choose a pure flash as a cloudy day frame and add it back to the input frame to generate flash and no flash input images. As we have expected, the generated sun images with the shadows, while the sky image is fully illuminated. This is corresponds to the manner of the sun and the sky. And we can use the sun images to do something like the outdoor photometric stereo, since the skylight is the directional light source. And we can also use the sky components to do something like the shadow removal, since it's area light source. And this is a very interesting direction in the future. Now, let's come to a conclusion of this talk. We propose a method to solve a highly used problem. And with SoLight, our method enables a wide range of applications, including light editing, sun and sky separation, and color photometric stereo. And we have already released our code base. And welcome to our poster session. Thank you. So if there are any questions, please come to the mics in the front of the room. And while you wait, let me ask a quick question. Um, so clearly, this thing will work as long as your flash reaches some point in the scene, right? So if something is too far away, it, you, know, you won't actually get that information. But do you have, have you considered ways where you can sort of like infer those colors by looking at other colors in the scene? So like if you have some colors where the flash does reach, and you know what it looks like without flash. Have you thought about extrapolating for places where your flash does not reach to? Because all you want from the flash image is the chromaticity information. Yeah. So that's a great question. And we do consider of light because we would like to apply our technique to the mobile device. And for most of the device, the flash is not strong enough. So this is uh, challenging. And uh, we have tried light, and for the outdoor scene we have seen before, so if we do the thing that's just suggested, we can just uh, show the corrected resource. If we do something like the propagate information from the flash illuminated region only. So this is a task if we just use, sorry. So we can use this mask to mask the regions that illuminated by the flashlight. And we can propagate the information from the masked regions to the no flash regions and refine the previous resource. And so this is what we have for the outdoor scenes. Are there other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again.
Okay, so the second talk in the session is titled Trapping Light for Time of Flight, and it's going to be presented by Leyland Su. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk on Trapping Light for Time of Flight. This is a joint work by Professor Mohit Gupta from University of Wisconsin-Madison and Professor Sri Nair from Columbia University. We have seen a revolution of 3D. In general, 3D is enabling many applications such as modeling of artifacts, manufacturing, medical surgery, gaming, and so on. In particular, some applications require full 360-degree surround 3D imaging of geometrically complex objects, including intricate machine parts, human bodies, and plants. However, one problem with capturing a complete 3D model is that any depth camera can only get a partial view of the object in its direct line of sight. To mitigate this problem, we have to either densely populate death cameras all around the object or rotate the object or the death camera. Unfortunately, these approaches require a long capture time, physical movement of the object or the camera, and registration. What people have done to mitigate these problems is by generating multiple views using mirrors. For example, the catadioptric stereo system utilizes two planar mirrors with a single camera. The cladoscopic image system further extended this idea by putting an object into a cladoscopic mirror system. However, the main challenge with any mirror-based multi-view method is the need to solve for the correspondence problem. For the serial case, Finding the correspondence precisely is known to be a very hard problem. For the kaleidoscopic case, even if we solve the correspondence problem, in order to triangulate, we need to assign each pixel to its corresponding virtual view. Unfortunately, this assignment problem can be solved only for relatively simple objects. In summary, while kaleidoscopic imaging can generate multiple views, they are limited to recover relatively coarse 3D models of mostly simple objects. However, there is another method to measure very precise depth, which is time of flight imaging. Can we use a time of flight scanner to recover complete 3D models of complex objects? And an immediate problem we are facing is that even with a time of flight scanner, there is still the same problem where we can only capture what's inside the scanner's field of view. To address this problem, we introduced the concept of a light trap. Consider this arbitrarily shaped light trap made of mirrors. We place an object inside of it. Imagine one ray of light emitted from the time of flight scanner. We shoot it into this light trap. This ray is forced to bounce around within the trap, and within a finite time, there is a very good chance that it will hit the object. Here's an interesting part. We, uh, when a light ray hits the object point, it scatters. But it is the ray which retraces its path back. Um, it is the ray which retraces its path that is the shortest ray and therefore, it gets back to the scanner first. What happened to all other rays? Well, it turns out that most of those rays cannot make their ways back to the scanner. And for those who can, they all travel longer. Again, shortest the path is the one where light retraced its path. Let's prove this observation by contradiction. Consider a light ray hitting a scene point like so. We know that this path must be the shortest path from the scanner to the scene point. 
Suppose for all the rays that make their ways back to the scanner, the shortest path is not the one like retraces, but instead a different path as indicated in the orange color. Then the light ray would have taken this orange path from the scanner to the scene point in the first place. This contradicts the given condition. Now that we know how light rays behave in the light trap, we can calculate the precise location of any scene point relative to the camera's location. We know the shape of the light trap, and we know the length of the light trap. We can use those information to fold this light path and find the precise 3D location of the scene point. Now, let's take a simple example. This is a qubit trap. Inside of it, we're going to put a lattice of spheres. We chose the lattice of spheres because this is a very complex object with strong occlusions. Light rays have to go through the gaps between outside spheres to reach the inside spheres. Now, let's run the simulation. What we're showing here is how, with time, as the scanner scans through the trap space, points on the surface of the spheres get illuminated and the color represents the number of bounces a ray took to get to that point. After limiting each light ray to bounce only five times, we have already reached 99.91% of all the surface area of this very complex lattice of spheres. While the simulation result is very encouraging, a question naturally arises is that what is a light trap that with a small number of bounces will be able to give a good coverage for any object? We want the light trap to not only ensure a dense coverage of scene points, but more importantly, a dense coverage of scene points from multiple directions. This is because the shape of the object is unknown. In some cases, like the lattice of spheres, rays may have to go through tiny gaps. The more directions there are, the more likely a point can be hit. Since there's no analytical solution to this question, we use a set of light, light traps with simple geometry and a set of objects with varying complexity to perform an empirical analysis. Here, we show the coverage result for each object against each trap shape. Surprisingly, we have not anticipated that the pyramid-shaped light trap gives near 100% coverage of all the surface areas of all the tested objects with just three bounces per light ray. This is a process of building the light trap. We start with building the base to hold the mirror light trap. We used four planar mirrors with aluminum coating to form the pyramid shape. The object to be scanned is placed inside the trap. Here we show, oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. Uh, here we show, uh, we, we perform a test scan. We show some complete 3D reconstruction results of our proposed light trap 3D imaging system. Just want to remind you that all the 3D models we will be showing are reconstructed from just the single viewpoint of the scanner. This is a wooden ball with simple geometry. This is how the scanner sees the object when being placed inside the light trap. In this example, the top surfaces of the ball is seen directly by the scanner. The first bounce gives us four different side images and the second bounce and the third bounce together gives pieces of the bottom surface of multiple, like of the bottom surface of the object multiple times. This is the depth map obtained from the time of flight sens sensor. After folding all the points back, as mentioned before, we get this 3D model of the ball. This is the point cloud. And this is the mesh with texture map. 
This is a toy truck. Notice that there are many services that can be occluded when looking from a single viewpoint. With the help of a light trap, we're able to see most of the occluded service clearly. Here's a 3D reconstructed model of the trap. This is the point cloud. And this is the mesh with texture map. Here's a lion. Notice the abdomen region of the lion can be very hard to reach. But our proposed method is able to fully recover the model as shown here. We have also tried our method on objects that are translucent and have subsurface scattering problem. We're able to get good results as well. By the way, there is a problem here, which is called the interreflection problem. Consider this light trap on the left. A light ray hits the object, but the illuminated object point can be seen from multiple mirrors, which means some light rays can hit the object, go to the mirror, and come back to the object again before retracing back to the, uh, to the sensor. Fortunately, these rays have longer paths and will be ignored by the pulsed time of flight scanner since it only considers the first return signal. What we have done here is using a time of flight scanner to recover 3D models. Our goal is to go to the next level by using a full frame flash time of flight camera, which simultaneously measure the entire image. However, when using a flash time of flight camera, there's no guarantee that the light ray sent out from one pixel is received by the same pixel. This is a really interesting decoding problem which we're currently looking at. In conclusion, the time of flight based light trap 3D imaging system uses a single scanner at a single viewpoint to ensure a dense and complete coverage of geometrically complex objects. Thank you very much for your time. I'm glad to take any questions. If anyone has questions, please sort of go to either of the two mics at the front of the room. I have a question. Um, oh, hi. Uh, oh, he can go first. So go how ahead. do you separate the, distinguish between the second bound from a point from for the first bounds of a distant point, more distant point. Uh, so if a ray goes from the, mm -hmm. from the source mm -hmm. and hits an object point and you get it back, mm -hmm. at the same time you might also get another ray uh, that came for the, as a second return but from a closer point on the object. Um, we are using a 3D um, scanner which ensures, so a 3D, how a 3D scanner works is that it emits one light ray each time. So there won't be um, other light rays um, in the scene. But this is a problem, as I said, this is a problem with a full frame camera. So this is a problem we're currently looking at. Yeah. So <clears throat> it seems to me that your, um, your, uh, your assumption is that uh, your rays only go along the path of least time. And I can believe it's true for what you showed with you have, when you have smooth objects. But when you have very sharp objects with very sharp corners, then you have not only specular reflections, but also diffractions. And I, can, I saw your picture up there, and I, <clears throat> I can see a ray entering your little small aperture in your light box. If it hit the side of that very sharp corner of the aperture, it would create a diffraction ray that would go down to your object. If your object was uh, sharp, then you get a diffraction ray that would go back and be the first arrival back, however weak, into your uh, camera recording system. So do you have a comment on that? Are you implicitly assuming specular reflections in smooth objects? Or can you also, are you going to have problems with very sharp objects with sharp corners? Uh, as from the experimental results, we, um, so we use um, the Leica P40 um, 3D scanner 
to, to perform all these results. And then from the ex experimental result, we did not quite see um, such cases. I guess um, my assumption here is that maybe those rays, mm -hmm. um, even though they can eventually come back to the scanner, uh, is too weak um, to be considered um, and then to be put into the result, the okay. point cloud. Okay. Yeah. So I think your assumption is every, all the reflections are specular, not, not diffractions. Uh, Otherwise, I can find rays that are first arrivals that not are the uh, arrivals associated with your fifth order multiple. Yeah, um, yeah, um, this might be the, a potential um, direction we're going to look at in the future. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker one more time. Is there Uh, my name is Mohit Gupta. I'm going to be chairing the rest of the session. The third talk in this session is uh, the perception distortion trade-off will be presented by Yohai. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Yohai. I will present the perception distortion trade-off and this is joint work with my advisor Tomer Michaeli from the Technion. So, we will talk about image restoration where you have some low quality image and you want to obtain a high quality version of that image. So common scenarios can be super resolution, where you try to enhance the resolution, image and painting, where you try to reconstruct missing pixels, denoising, where you try to suppress noise, and so on. And in these image restoration tasks, you can ask, what are the goals? So first, you want your reconstruction to be similar to the ground truth image, which we call low distortion. And second, regardless of the ground truth image, you want your reconstruction to have good perceptual quality. That does not contain any artifacts, blur, or anything that would disclose that the reconstruction is not the ground truth image. Now note that these two goals are not the same. For example, you can obtain perfect perceptual quality by randomly drawing natural images which have nothing to do with the input image, which of course be quite bad in terms of distortion. However, intuitively, minimizing distortion should lead to good perceptual quality. For example, if you can perfectly reconstruct, then you have zero distortion and good perceptual quality. But what about the scenarios where you cannot perfectly reconstruct, such as super resolution, in painting, denoising, deblurring, etc.? In our work, we show that in these scenarios, algorithms cannot achieve both low distortion and good perceptual quality. There is a trade off between these two goals, and one will come at the expense of the other. So there has been some empirical evidence of this. For example, in the SR gun paper presented last year at CVPR, the authors presented a super resolution model with superior perceptual quality as rated by human observers. And when we compare this model to other models which excel at distortion, it's apparent that the SR gun is quite worse in terms of distortion. On average, this is 2.5 dB in PSNR. And this is not the only super resolution algorithm showing this phenomenon. So you can think of the following experiment. Let's rate algorithms by two measures. The first measure will be a distortion measure, here the squared error. And the second will be a quality measure which does not rely on the ground truth image. So it sees the reconstruction and predicts its perceptual quality. Here we use the recent method of Maya et al, which accurately predicts human opinion scores. So you want your algorithm to be here, where distortion is low, and perceptual quality is good. So let's take 15 recent super resolution algorithms and plot them here, and this is what we get. So first notice that no algorithm is at the origin, so no algorithm is good at distortion and perceptual quality. And indeed, if we start at the upper left corner, where distortion is low, the reconstructions are blurry and unnatural. And as we gradually move downwards, they become more and more realistic at the cost of higher distortion. And this is because the features making these realistic are hallucinated and do not appear in the input image, in the ground truth image. Why is this happening? So most works attribute this to the squared error not being a good similarity metric between images. And indeed, there have been many 
other suggestions for more advanced image similarity metrics. Will these advanced measures solve this problem? The answer is no. Here you see the exact same plot for SSIM, multiscale SSIM, IFC, VIF, and the deep layer of the VGG net. And in all, the origin is blank, so no algorithm is good at perceptual quality and at distortion, and this is no matter how you would measure distortion. And in our work, we mathematically prove that such a trade-off exists in the general reconstruction scenario. So, you can think of a two-dimensional plane where the first axis is distortion and the second is perceptual quality. And again, what you want to do is approach the origin. However, this is impossible. We show there is a bound in such a plane, and all algorithms must lie above this bound. So you can imagine your algorithm here at the red dot, and you want to improve in distortion. What our theory implies is that if you want to move to the left to improve in distortion, you must also move upwards and degrade in perceptual quality. And on the contrary, if you want to improve in perceptual quality, that is, move downwards, you must also move to the right and degrade in terms of distortion. So to show this, we have to mathematically define what we mean by distortion and perceptual quality. So in the image restoration scheme, you have some underlying natural image X, but you only have access to a degraded version Y. And you want to reconstruct the original image. Your reconstruction is X hat, and this is an estimation of X. So in statistical terms, you can't think of X as being drawn from the distribution of natural images, PX and the degradation defined by some conditional distribution, and note that this is the most general way to define a degradation. It can, of course, account for additive noise, downsampling, blur, etc. So distortion is straightforward. You choose some dissimilarity metric delta between images, and you take a mean over draws of natural images and the randomness of the degradation. And our theory will apply to any such dissimilarity metric delta. It could be the squared error, it could be SSIM, it could be any other advanced measure. But how would you quantify perceptual quality? Well, in recent years, it's becoming increasingly popular to perform the following test. You take either the natural or reconstructed image, eat with 50% probability, and you go to human observers and you ask them, is this real or fake? Is this image the natural or reconstructed image? And what people quantify is the success rate in such a task, where a lower success rate indicates better perceptual quality. Well, this is not a mathematical definition because there is a human in the loop, but... What this is, is a Bayesian hypothesis testing scenario, and it's very easy to show that the optimal success rate is proportional to the total variation distance between the distributions of both classes, that is, the distribution of natural images, Px, and the distribution of reconstructed images, Px hat. So according to this common test, we will define perceptual quality as the divergence between Px and Px hat, and our theory will apply to all popular divergences. It could be the total variation, could be kullback leibler or any other popular measure. So to recap, what we show is that by minimizing distortion, you will not obtain an algorithm which follows the statistics of natural images. So how do we show this? We study the following problem. For some distortion level, we ask what is the best perceptual quality you can obtain? That is, how far downwards can you move? which corresponds to this optimization problem. What is the optimal perceptual quality for some bound on the distortion? And we want to study this for all levels of distortion. Well, there is no closed form solution to such a problem. However, we can prove some interesting characteristics of this function, which we denote the perception distortion function. And this is the blue line plotted here on the side. So namely, this perception distortion function is monotonically non-increasing and convex. And this is true for any dissimilarity metric in all popular divergences. So the structure is as seen here. And what convexity implies is that in the low distortion and high perceptual quality regime, the trade-off becomes stronger. There is another interesting question we can answer. So let's say you have the algorithm with the minimal possible distortion. And now you want to obtain perfect perceptual quality. That is Px equals Px hat here. How much would you have to pay in terms of distortion to obtain this? Well, we show that this will never be more, for the RMSC distortion, this will never be more than a factor of square root of 2. 
which in terms of PSNR is 3 dB. So you do not need to degrade more than 3 dB in PSNR to obtain perfect perceptual quality. Now let's go back to the super resolution algorithms and look at the one with the minimal possible distortion. And now let's move a factor of square root of two and this brings us here. And as you see to date, algorithms with the best perceptual quality are actually compromising around 3 dB in PSNR which aligns with our theory. So we have shown some theoretical characteristics of the perception distortion trade-off. But is there an algorithmic way of approaching such a bound? And the answer is yes. And in fact, this has already been done by gun-based image restoration schemes, which define a loss term with a distortion and an adversarial term, which actually approximates the theoretical distortion and the divergence between px and px hat. So these schemes are actually trying to jointly minimize the distortion and the ability to discriminate between natural and reconstructed images, which improve the perceptual quality. Now, if you view lambda as a Lagrange multiplier, minimizing for some lambda corresponds to solving the perception distortion function for some value of d. And if we do this for a set of lambdas, we can approximate the perception distortion function. And we do this. So we take MNIST digits, we add noise, and now we're trying to reconstruct by minimizing this loss where distortion is the squared error, and the adversarial term is the Wasserstein distance between px and px hat minimized by a Wasserstein gun. So these are the results where each point here is a neural net optimized for some value of lambda, and you can see that as we allow for a higher distortion, we can obtain a closer distance between px and px hat, and indeed, this corresponds to a gradual increase in the perceptual quality of the reconstructions. Let's talk about the take-home messages. So there is a trade-off between perceptual quality and distortion. And what this actually implies is that there is no single measure that can tell you which algorithm is optimal because this is task dependent. So if your task is reconstructing medical images, you would perhaps want algorithm A with a very low distortion. But if you want to enhance your personal photos, you would perhaps want algorithm B, which would make them look nice. So what you actually want to do is define what distortion level your task can tolerate. And once you've done this, you want to move downwards toward the bound as far as you can go. So for example, for this distortion level, algorithm C is the optimal one. And there is actually a systematic way of doing this, and this is by using gun-based image restoration schemes. I will just say one last thing. We are organizing a workshop on perceptual image restoration at ECCV, and there are already three challenges which are running, so please join us. And at this point, I will happily answer any questions you may have. All right, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, while we are waiting, uh, I have one. Uh, so you talked about improving the perceptual quality, but in many applications, uh, you know, the goal is not to get a good-looking image, but perhaps preserve some information for downstream tasks, maybe recognition, 3D recovery, et cetera, et cetera. So the conclusions that, hold, that you talked about here, would they apply to those scenarios as well? Yes, of course. So uh, there is a trade-off between the two, and you, for each task, you would want to define where you want to be on the trade-off. So if you are trying to, if you want your own images to look nice and you don't care about moving from the ground truth, you should choose to be more on the perception side. But if you have some task where being uh, uh, close to the ground truth is important, like maybe medical images, then you certainly should uh, go for distortion, but you need to understand that you are going to compromise the perceptual quality because the trade-off always exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I Question over here. Could you comment on, as you approach the limit, in both axis for both distortion as well as the perceptual quality, what those limit would be, or um, in actual practice, what they actually represent? I'm sorry, I didn't exactly understand the question. Okay, so when you have the curve of perceptual quality as well as the um, distortion, uh, right now we're trying to find a sweet spot between perceptual quality as well as distortion. But if we say that we don't actually care about distortion, we want the best perceptual quality, so we want to actually go to either extremes, um, what would be the actual method to achieve that? 
Okay, that's actually a good question. So you're asking, uh, well, how far can we go in terms of perceptual quality? So sure. you can always obtain perfect perceptual quality. So there will always exist an algorithm where Px equals Px hat, the distributions are equal. And we actually, uh, in our paper, have such an estimator. Um, and you can always obtain zero uh, a divergence between Px and Px hat, but there perhaps are smarter ways to do so. So we do not know uh, for obtaining the perfect perceptual quality, how low a distortion you can get, but for very high distortions, if you have uh, no bound on the distortion, you can always do this, and we can take even a very naive example. If you just randomly draw natural images which do not have anything to do with the input image, you obtain perfect perceptual quality, but this is very bad in distortion. So there are better ways to obtain perfect perceptual quality while still being with lower distor distortion than this naive example. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. We can take one more question maybe from the right hand side. Uh, I'd just like to uh, clarify. So your results imply that there cannot be any algorithm that recovers the ground truth consistently. Is that correct? Okay, so uh, as I said in the beginning, if you can perfectly reconstruct, which means that your degradation is invertible, then of course you can get perfect distortion and perfect uh, a perceptual quality. But for the scenarios where you cannot perfectly reconstruct, which means the degradation is non-invertible, then this is true. Yes. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, we have to keep moving along. We can take the rest of the questions offline, perhaps. Uh, we'll thank the speaker one more time. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with the spotlight section of this session. Uh, it's going to be four minutes per presentation. Uh, no audience questions, so sit back and enjoy the show. Okay. Get my cheat sheet ready. So, hi hey everyone. I'd like to present our work labeled the Noising Adversarial Network for Inverse Lighting of Faces. I'm Hao Zhou from the University of Maryland, and this work is in cooperation with Jin Sun, Yasser Yakub, and David Jacobs. Inverse lighting from faces can be used in many applications, such as lighting transfer and image forensics. Traditionally, lighting can be estimated as a byproduct of fitting a 3D morphing model, or it could be achieved through intrinsic image decomposition of a single object. However, these existing methods are always optimization-based, and they are usually slow and perform poorly on low-resolution images. In our work, we propose to use deep learning for this task. The biggest challenge is that we do not have enough face images with ground truth lighting. So here, we apply existing method serves to extract lighting from face images. However, these estimated lightings are noisy. Directly using them to train the network will not give us the optimal solution. So here, we use synthetic data, which has no noise in their labels, to help train the trial network. Our basic idea is to transfer the feature of real images to the space of features of synthetic images, which is noise-free, so as to alleviate the effect of noise in the lighting labels. Although similar ideas have been tried in classification tasks, we are the first to apply this idea to a regression problem. For our method, we first train a network using synthetic data. Here, we divide our network into two parts, feature network to extract lighting-related features, and the lighting network to regress spherical harmonics. While training the network for real faces, we use the noisy labels for regression loss. Moreover, we fix the lighting net learned from the synthetic faces, and then we train a feature network so that the distribution of lighting-related features from real faces will be similar to that of the synthetic faces by applying this adversarial loss. Since the space of synthetic faces is noise-free, we can alleviate the effect of noise in the real labels. Different from classification, the noisy labels, as anchor point here, are important for regression. For example, in this case, if A and B belong to the same class, both of these two mappings will be the same for classification. However, for a regression problem, 
only one of these two mappings will be correct. For evaluation, we use the MultiPy dataset. We apply our network to extract lightings for images in MultiPy. And then we do a classification for these estimated lightings using nearest neighbor metric. The left figure compares top one to top three classification accuracy for SERFs training without synthetic data and the proposed method. And we can see that the proposed methods improve the baseline by a large margin. In the right figure, we show the performance of our trend network on images of different resolution. We can see that the proposed method is quite robust to low resolution images. And here we show some qualitative results. We see that surfs is easily affected by occlusion and may produce an incorrect color for lighting. Well, the proposed method can avoid such problems. Okay, so if you have any comments or questions, please come to our post session. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Parsan Mirdegan, and today I'll present a completely different approach to structured light triangulation. This work is joined with Wencheng Chen and Kiros Kutulakos, who are in Salt Lake City and will be at our poster number E22. Projecting a sequence of multiple patterns sequentially onto a static scene to compute a stereo correspondences is the most accurate and efficient way to acquire dense 3D point clouds. Its depth accuracy can go well below a millimeter, can be applied to high speed scenes, and also can deal with photometrically complex objects. Even though this technique has been used for decades, two fundamental questions still remain open. First, what is the optimal sequence of K patterns to project? That is the sequence that minimizes the expected number of incorrect correspondences for a given system. Answering this question amounts to computing a K by M matrix that assigns a k-dimensional vector to each projector column. Second, what is the optimal decoding algorithm? That is the algorithm that maps the k-measurements captured at each pixel to the corresponding projector column. In this work, we provide for the first time a general solution to these two problems. Specifically, we derive an algorithm for computing pattern sequences on the fly that are optimized for a particular system and imaging condition. Moreover, we show that there is an extremely simple pattern-independent algorithm for computing pixel-wise correspondences that is near optimal in a maximum likelihood sense. Also, on the experimental side, our qualitative and quantitative analysis show that our optimized pattern sequences and decoder give much more accurate results compared to the state-of-the-art, especially on the hardest cases. What this means is that rather than proposing yet another sequence of patterns, for structured light, we provide an algorithm. The algorithm takes as input a set of user specs, including the number of projector and camera pixels, the desired number of patterns, the specific camera and projector arrangement, a bounding volume that contains the objects to be scanned, any desired bounds on the pattern spatial frequency content, and possibly many other specifications, and outputs a sequence of patterns that minimizes the expected number of stereo correspondence errors under those specified conditions. We call this paradigm optimal structured light a la carte. And because this algorithm takes just a couple of minutes to run on a standard laptop, in practice you can think of it giving us a set of knobs for tuning pattern sequences to a particular system and imaging conditions. You just dial in the desired settings and out comes the optimized pattern sequence. This sequence is designed to minimize the similarity of observation vectors produced by different projector pixels under the specified conditions. So changing the number of patterns, changing their maximum spatial frequency, changing the expected signal to noise ratio, or changing the geometry constraint gives very different results. In practice, our qualitative and quantitative experiments show that these optimized patterns outperform the state-of-the-art techniques such as microphase shifting and embedded phase shifting. Our approach results in depth maps with much fewer outliers. Also, the quantitative results in our poster show that we achieve higher accuracy in grand truth experiments. 
While unfortunately I will not be at the poster session this afternoon because of visa issues, my co-authors Wencheng and Kiros will be at poster E22 to say more about the theory behind this work and also to show you lots of experimental results. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Brandon Smith, and this is joint work with Matthew O'Toole and Mohit Gupta. So our goal is to track the micrometer scale motion of multiple objects using, uh, without the use of sophisticated optics. And to do this, we use an unusual imaging modality called speckle. So let's look at an example. Here we're illuminating a small piece of white chalk with coherent light from a diffuse laser. A conventional camera records the image on the left. On the right is exactly the same scene, but now recorded by a bare lensless sensor. This random pattern is due to interactions of the coherent light with the surface of the object and is called speckle. In this sequence, the object moves very slowly and we can barely see the movement in the conventional camera. But on the bare sensor, the motion is greatly magnified. In fact, uh, speckle motion measurement is so sensitive that it can be used to measure the speech and heartbeat of uh, people remotely. So in this work, we're especially interested in using speckle imaging to track the tiny motion of multiple objects. This forms the foundation for many interesting applications, such as stem cell tracking or subtle hand gesture recognition. And an interesting test case is tracking the hands of a wristwatch. So the watch face here is illuminated by a diffuse laser and again imaged by a bare sensor. Using speckle imaging, our images for tracking is challenging because they don't provide spatial information about the scene and all motions are superimposed over the entire image. We show that it's possible to use the statistical properties of speckle to separate and label multiple motions in a speckle sequence and this is one of our key contributions. So here are some tracking results. Um, we have three different plots showing the, the change in angle of each uh, watch hand over time. Note that the scale of the y-axis is different for each plot. Um, and despite the huge dynamic range of motion, we can track all three watch hands simultaneously. It may sound like science fiction, but we can even adapt these techniques to track objects around a corner. Consider this experimental configuration. A camera records a patch on a diffuse, non-reflective wall. A one-inch diameter piece of chalk is moved along a small trajectory. The object is occluded by a sidewall so that neither the camera nor the light source are in direct line of sight of the object. As the object moves, this is what the camera records. If you look closely, you might be able to see a faint moving speckle pattern. And by dividing the raw captured image at each frame by the mean image and normalizing, we recover what we call the, the ratio image sequence. And the moving speckle pattern is now more clearly visible. And we can use it to track the motion of an object around the corner with high precision. In this case, the chalk object is moved along an intricate micrometer scale trajectory by a high precision translation stage. We now move to the much more challenging case of tracking multiple simultaneously moving objects around the corner. Even after the ratio images are computed, the motion of the speckle pattern is much more chaotic than the single object case. Nonetheless, we can track two or more objects around, uh, moving along small intricate trajectories at macroscopic distances. So in summary, we have shown for the first time that it's possible to track the micron scale trajectories of multiple simultaneously moving objects outside the line of sight using only off-the-shelf imaging components. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Manuel Baradat, and I'm going to present our latest work on light field inference from shadows. Imagine yourself being into a room like this, and all you can see is a shadow and the occluder that is causing the shadow. Although the rest of the room is totally hidden from you, what can you tell about it? Can you tell whether there is something or not? Can you tell the albedo, the size, or the position of the things that are in the room? As in this case, these two colored squares. In this work, we propose a method to infer the light field of the hidden scene which are all the rays emitted by the hidden elements. 
In these situations, modeling the light field has two advantages. First, it allows us to easily model any arbitrary scenario. And second, with the inferred light field, we can produce multiple views of the hidden scene and perceive the depth at which the hidden elements are placed. To do this, we model the imaging process with a big and sparse transfer matrix that maps light fields into observations. This matrix incorporates the propagation effects, the occlusion, and the diffuse reflection for each ray of the light field. For general light fields, this system is extremely opposed, so we require a strong pair on light fields to estimate the most plausible one. The prior we propose is based on three simple assumptions on the, light, on the elements that conform the hidden scene. We assume that they are mostly planar and diffuse, their textures are smooth, and occlusions are negligible. These simple assumptions can be easily expressed in the Fourier domain, and they reduce the effective dimensionality of the inverse problem to attract all size. Then, assuming additive Gaussian noise at the observation, we can solve the map problem by explicit inversion. And with all this, we can infer the spectrum of a light field uh, multiplying an observation by a single matrix. So how do we do this in practice? First, we start by computing the transfer matrix illuminating small regions in a screen and recording the shadow projecting into the observation wall. Once we have obtained the transfer matrix, we can start taking observations for different hidden scenes. As we assume that all the light reaching the observation comes only from the hidden elements, we need to subtract a background image without the scene in place. Using ambient illumination, the amount of light emitted from the hidden scene is too low, leading to high noise observations. To overcome this, we simply place direct illumination, which allows recovering observations with reasonably high SNR. Uh, the following examples will show horizontal views of the recovered light field for two hidden scenes consisting of two red and blue targets at different depths. In reconstruction one, the horizontal views do not show parallax, from which we can deduce that both targets are at the same depth. In the other hand, reconstruction two shows parallax, from which we can deduce that these two targets are at different depths. This allows disentangling the ambiguity between size and depth that would happen in a single view reconstruction. Furthermore, our method also works for arbitrary hidden scenes that do not follow strictly our prior conditions, as is the case of this mannequin head. To the best of our knowledge, this work is the first to demonstrate reconstructions for arbitrary occluders and scenes in a passive non-line of sight setting. With all this, we believe that our method and experimental results demonstrate that the hidden patterns of shadows can reveal a rich wall of previously invisible information. We invite you to check the code and data in our website and our poster at F6 for further details. Thanks. Hello all, my name is Tal, and this is a joint work with Tomer Michaeli and Lee Zelnik Manor from the Technion and Tali Dekel from Google Research. Repetitions of patterns and structures is a widespread phenomenon in flowers, animal furs, and different kinds of fruits and vegetables. Recurring structures can also be found in man-made environments, for example, a building with many windows or a brick wall. In many cases, the recurring structures are not perfectly identical, and sometimes the deviation from an ideal structure are small and hard to notice to the naked eye. Recently, an algorithm was devised for correcting the non-local variations in a single image, and the application of this approach to graphics and material ins inspections were explored. Here we can see flickering between the input images and the corrected images. When multiple images of the same object are available, applying the non-local variations algorithm independently to each image leads to inconsistent corrections, and hence the ability to reconstruct a corresponding 3D shape is damaged. In this work, we present an approach to multi-view non-local variations, which extend the single image algorithm to several images of the same scene. In 
the, the original algorithm attempts to determine a transformation T that produces an image J with strong patch recurrence. When more than a single view of the scene is available, we want the correction of the non-local variations to be consistent across views. To achieve this goal, we incorporate a correspondence loss which constrains the transformations T1 and T2 to be similar. This is done by demanding similarity between their corresponding flow fields. Here is an example of a pair of images of the Casa Mila building taken at different times and from different viewpoints. Applying the single image non-local variations algorithm corrects each image differently and the 3D reconstruction is damaged. Our algorithm, on the other hand, leads to a good corrected 3D reconstruction. And here you can see flickering between the input and the output images. In this example of a bumpy wall, we can see the corrected images with more recurrent shapes. Here too, when flickering between the input and the output images, we can see that the berries become more similar in shape. By applying the inverse tr transformations, we can extenuate the variations. To handle more than two images, like in this video example, we add a temporal component to make the correction co consistent across views. Thank you, please come and visit our poster. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chen Jie from NTU of Singapore, and I'm presenting our work on robust video content alignment and composition for rain removal in a CNN framework. So rain impedes both outdoor uh, vision for both human and cameras. To improve the vision, two terrain frameworks are available. The first one uses features and priors from a single image, and the second one does so using a video sequence, which faces challenges during content, uh, for content uh, alignment, especially for in scenarios of fast camera motion, complex in dynamics, and variation of frame looks. And our work will take on these challenges. So differentiate, to differentiate rain pixels, we first match the scene contents based on super pixels. The super pixels as a unit can robustly counter the interference of the rain, and its boundaries usually adheres to the object boundaries, and each unit is very likely to show identical motion between the frames. So given a video buffer, buffer we apply the rain on the central view using its past and future references. The target frame is divided into super pixels. For each super pixel, we look at its local, spatial, and temporal buffer. So the first round of template matching will be carried out with the superpixel shape as mask, which will find a best match for each frame. A rain map will be robustly calculated based on these temporal references. The rain map will be used then as the new template and based on which a second round of matching will be carried out. This time, the matching is more robust to rain re interferences and focus on scene content similarities. A group of matched examples sorted according to their similarity scores will be found this time. With the abundant randomness between them, the rain can be suppressed when they are averaged. However, this will introduce additional blur. So this blurred rain-free match patch can be used to replace the rain pixels indicated by the rain map and become the initial rain removal estimate. However, the rain map has errors. The temporal matches embed abundant reference information, and they will be extremely useful in correcting this. Additionally, the rain removal suffer from blur, and the second group of matches is robust to rain and gives scene content details. So these three features will be combined together as input to the subsequent CNN to estimate a rain map, a rain-free high-frequency content details and add back to the average as the final outcome. 
So for, the, for network training, we have taken eight video sequences from car-mounted cameras, and the car speed goes up from to 30 kilometers to 50 kilometers per hour. And the Adobe After Effects is used to synthesize the rain. So here is the rain restoration PSNR based on our testing data set with synthetic rain. And our method clearly outperformed both cellular image and video-based methods for both slow and fast cameras. And the advantage is especially obvious for fast cameras. So here we show some visual comparison with state-of-the-art methods. As can be seen, the image-based methods on the first row leave significant amount of rain unremoved when the rain streaks are large and opaque. And the video-based methods on the second row tend to cause serious blur when the camera is moving fast. And our method, method on the bottom right can deal with both situations well. So an optimized implementation of our code can now run at uh, 15 frames per second, so it is suitable for real-time applications. Thank you. Welcome to check out our poster. Hi, this is Shomudip. Today, I'm going to present SFSNet, Learning Shape, Reflectance, and Illuminance of Faces in the Wild. In this work, we aim to decompose a face into surface normal, which indicates facial geometry, lighting, which is represented as shading, and albedo, which is the reflective property of the face. This is a classical problem in computer vision known as inverse rendering or shape from shading. One application is image relighting, which is important in AR and VR. So why is this problem so difficult? Machine learning with deep networks need lots of label training data. For synthetic images, we have good amount of label training data. But for real images, we do not have enough. And networks trained on synthetic images fails to capture the variations present in real images. To solve this problem, we train on real data. We solve for all the intrinsic components jointly, such that we can reconstruct the original image and use a photometric reconstruction loss for training. We use a mixture of labeled synthetic and unlabeled data, real data for training, this decomposition. Also, we propose a novel residual block-based architecture for, which is inspired by our physical rendering model. For more details about the paper, we will talk in the post, we can talk in the poster session. Next, I'm going to show some results, a comparison with neural face, which also performs inverse rendering of geometry, albedo, and lighting by, as a learning problem for facial editing. One application of inverse rendering is lighting transfer. Given a source and a target image, we want to relight the target image with the source lighting. This can be done with our decomposition framework. We also compare this with that of neural face. As you can see, neural face result contains the orange glow present in the target image. This is because it fails to separate the orange lighting from the albedo. Whereas our SFS net correctly decomposes the orange light from the albedo and thereby reduce its effect in the relit image. Next, we compare with MOFA, which also performs inverse rendering of geometry, albedo, and lighting by fitting a 3D morphable model. Because of morphable model fitting, sometimes MOFA fails to retain the identity of that person in the reconstructed image. Next, we compare with algorithms that independently solve for facial geometry. As you can see, for easy ambient illumination, our method performs comparable to these algorithms. But for hard illuminations, our SFSNet can recover much more accurate details than Pix to Vertex. This is because SFSNet learns to reason about geometry by utilizing the lighting cues. Next, we also compare with algorithms which independently estimate lighting from a single image. We can outperform all of them without fine tuning. We further estimate normal estimation accuracy and compare with algorithms which only solve for facial geometry. We also outperform these algorithms. 
Thus, it is possible to solve co for all components jointly and perform better than solving them independently. Here are some more results on some real world images. We show normal, albedo, shading, and reconstruction. We also show some relit images to understand the normal. Key takeaway from this talk, jointly solving for all components can be better than solving these individual components. It's very important to train on real data. For more details, we can talk at post array 15 and our codes are released. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Yu Shen Chen. Our paper's title is Deep Photo Enhancer, Unpaired Learning for Image Enhancement from Photographs with Scans. As shown in the video, the left is the input, and the right is our method's output. Our method can enhance the image automatically with pleasing results. In addition, we didn't see any obvious temporal flick on the video. First, we show some examples. These three images are the inputs. These are our enhanced images. We can notice that the resource contrast is higher and the color is more natural than before. We can see the input and the output again. Image enhancement is a very difficult problem because the good images are highly subjective. So basically, software provides a lot of handcrafted photo filters for users to select. For example, we can see some results from Google Photo Editor app. The result of accentuate filters looks better, but still not too impressive. And the result of morning filter looks some kind of weird. In summary, users need to spend the time to pick an appropriate filter. Traditional methods provide a lot of interactive tools for, for users to adjust the image, such as the sliders on the right side. However, the quality of the results highly depends on skills and aesthetic judgment of the users. In addition, it often takes a significant amount of time to reach satisfactory retouching results. This paper proposed an automatic method for image enhancement. Given a set of photographs with the desired characteristics, the proposed method learns a photo enhancer which transfers an input image into an enhanced image with those characteristics. A knife approach for image enhancement is using supervised learning. The label is the input image retouched by the colorist. We can learn the mapping function directly. However, it requires pair data and the result is not impressive. So our approach is using unpaired learning. We collected an HDR data set as the desired samples. And similar to CycleGAN, our method is based on two-way gain, but with three improvements. We can see our result is significantly better than cycle gain. Our three improvements focus on the generator, loss function, and the normalization. Our improvement method is general and thus it can be applied to other applications, such as segmentation, image synthesis, and image-to-image -image translation. Thank you for your attention. Please search Deep Photo Enhancer for the details. You can upload and get an enhanced image immediately on the demo website. If you are interested in our paper, please come to our poster session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Abhi. I will be presenting our work on the Lime model uh, method for real-time material estimation for general shaped objects from a single image. 
Estimating the BRDF or reflectance of real, uh, real world objects is an important task in AR applications, particularly for cloning virtual objects from real material. Augmented reality poses new challenges to this old problem. The material estimation has to be done in real time, in uncontrolled lighting, in in the wild settings, from a limited number of sensors, perhaps a single RGB camera, and for objects of any and every shape. And no previous approach has solved all of these problems together. Mathematically, the nature of the problem can be described uh, as being highly underconstrained, nonlinear, dense, and high dimensional. But fortunately, the material spans a natural subspace. You can guess what all this means exactly, deep learning. So, uh, deep learning can solve a lot of uh, what ails this problem. The previous methods, the, uh, the previous methods tend to pose this as a direct regression task image and result out, which leads to overfitting and uh, hence insuff insufficient generalization. We instead um, employ uh, the underlying image formation uh, process based on the rendering equation to break down the task. We use the Blinfong reflectance model to approximate the rendering equation and obtain a linear decomposition into albedo and shading components. Let's see how we estimate the intrinsic layers. We first perform an object segmentation task and then decompose the image into specular shading image from which we estimate the diffuse and specular albedos. In order to train the network, we use the ground to diffuse shading image. This enables us to pose the problem as a combined parameter regression and image translation task, mimicking the underlying uh, rendering process. What this architecture enables is a unique rendering loss that can be used to train these networks jointly to produce consistent outputs that can faithfully reproduce the input image. Such a loss ensures that our networks learn uh, the 2D deconvolution process that is inherent to reflectance and lighting separation. The Blinfong reflectance model also has a nonlinear parameter, that is the specular uh, roughness or the shininess, uh, which is perceptually the most important parameter and perhaps the most difficult to estimate. Instead of regressing it di directly from the input, we employ a novel strategy. We estimate what we call the mirror image, which is a version of the input image if the object were mirror-like. This image essentially captures the high-frequency environment map as reflected by the object. The mirror image behaves as an absolute comparative reference to the specular shading image based on which the network can estimate nonlinear roughness or shininess. Another advantage of estimating the mirror image is that if the object normals are known, uh, it can be unwrapped to estimate the environment map. Thus, when a depth sensor is available uh, along with the RGB camera, we can use the mirror image to reconstruct high-frequency environment maps as well. The, uh, we use synthetically generated training data and perform end-to-end -end joint training of all our networks, obtaining a throughput of more than 70 frames per second. Uh, here, note our material estimation results on a range of objects, starting on the left from the most diffuse to the uh, most specular on the right. Please also note the segmentation masks for the various objects. We also retarget materials from a source object uh, by estimating its material and transferring to a new source shape to obtain material transfer results. Note that we obtain a faithful reproduction of the material where other state-of-the-art methods fail. Finally, with the availability of a depth sensor, we also estimate a high-frequency environment map, leading to photorealistic rendering of this bunny from the material of the water bottle. We show the various intermediate results as well. So all of our data is available online. Uh, you can find my co-authors in blue, Michael and uh, Christian, around anywhere, and feel free to ask them any questions. Uh, our poster is F21. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ling Guanzhen from Princeton University. Our work is about analyzing texture images to det reliably detect distinctive key points. Key point detection has traditionally been the first stage of image matching and localization pipelines. However, we have observed that the best existing key point detectors are mostly engineered for natural images. This is a problem because key point detectors designed for natural images do not perform consistently on texture images that contain different kinds of dominant features. We are interested in texture images because previous work has demonstrated a compelling application that uses texture images to enable precise global localization. So, we learn key point textures for various types of textures with self-supervision. Our texture takes an input image and produces a response map using a fully convolutional neural network. We then extract key points from the response map using non-maximum suppression. The extracted key points can be used with any descriptor to enable practical applications such as localization. 
We train a network to let it predict scores for four image patches, including two versions of two regions. We first adopt ex existing ranking laws, which encourages the relative ranking of the scores to be consistent. However, both local maxima and minima can be used as features because negating the whole response map doesn't influence the, the ranking loss. In the context of texture images, we observe that either the local maxima or minima will be better than the other. For example, in the carpet texture at the top, key points picked from local maxima are more repeatable than local minima. In contrast, local minima lead to better repeatability in the asphalt texture shown below. Therefore, another contribution of our work is to pick either local maxima or minima based on the validation at training time. Unfortunately, this is still not sufficient because ranking loss alone does not lead to sharp, sharp local response. This toy example shows two curves with exactly the same relative ranking, but the green curve is too smooth for non-maximum expression, making key point localization unstable. Our contribution is introducing a new loss term to encourage local pickness so the network picks the orange curve instead of the green one. We divide training into two phases. We first pre train the network with ranking loss only and then fine tune with our new pickness loss. We evaluate our method on indoor and outdoor textures. The network trained with ranking loss only sometimes generates blurry response maps for challenging textures. Our fine tuned network produces much sharper response because of the pickness loss. Here we show some of the detected key points. This example shows a white stain on the asphalt texture. Using ranking loss only gives a reasonable response map, but our improved version produces much sharper response. This, this example shows imperfection on the wood texture. The response map is originally too smooth. With fine tuning, the response map becomes sharper, making key point detection more repeatable. Our tune detector drastically increases the number of repeatable key points we can detect, especially on challenging textures such as wood and concrete. In all our results, we train a detector for each texture separately. We did try training a universal detector using the union of all textures, but we have found that texture-specific training tends to do much better, especially on distinctive, distinctive textures such as the wood. For more details, please come to see our poster and refer to our paper. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mei Guangjin from University of Bern. I will present our paper, Learning to Extract a Video Sequence from a Single Motion Blurred Image. This is a joint work with my colleague, Givi Meshvili, and my advisor, Paolo Favaro. It is often said that photos capture memory an instant in time. Technically, however, this is not strictly true. Photos require to accumulate light from the scene. Thus, objects moving during the exposure generate motion blur in a photo. Motion blur is an image degradation that makes video contents less interpretable and is therefore often seen as a nuisance. Previous methods have shown great success in both single image motion deburring and video deburring. <clears throat> However, all these works focus on restoring the middle instant sharp frame from a blurry scene. In this work, we focus on a more general and challenging task. Given one motion blurry frame, we aim to reconstruct T-sharp instant frames of the scene. As far as we know, this is the first time this task has been addressed. When compared to existing deburring scenarios, our task is more challenging due to its large number of unknowns. Our system aims at restoring seven times the data in the single motion blurred image fed as input. The main challenge of this problem is the inherent temporal ambiguity. This simple example shows that both forward and backward motion generate the same blurry input. In practice, the temporal ambiguity can be more complex. The, this toy example shows that there are more cases than the forward-backward motion ambiguity. If we assume temporal smoothness, with two moving objects, there are four different sequences ending up with the same blurry input. This means that temporal ambiguities increase 
as 2 to the power of n as the number of individual moving objects n increases. However, there are some consistencies. Among all possible sequences, the middle frame is always consistent. We assume this is the main reason why previous methods can achieve success to predict the middle frame. Besides that, we introduced two more consistencies. For the middle symmetric frames, their summation is also the same for all ambiguities. Similarly, the absolute difference between two middle symmetric frames is also the same for all ambiguities. Based on these consistencies, we propose a deep learning based approach to sequentially predict seven frames. In our first step, we, the ambiguity free middle frame is estimated. Then we estimate the pairs of middle symmetric frames by defining loss functions on our order invariant statistics, the summation and the absolute difference of the frame pairs. Additionally, we use adversarial training to further improve the visual quality of the predicted frames. In our first step, we train a network to predict ambiguity-free middle frame. In our second step, we estimate pairs of middle symmetric frames. Our loss based on the two order invariant statistics can include all possible predictions during the training. Our proposed solution is able to predict seven frames, which also includes the middle frame. Thus, we compare our results with state-of-the-art single image delivering method. In summary, we solve a new and more general task, extracting a video sequence from a motion blurred image. To handle the temporal ambiguities, we propose a novel temporal invariant loss to address the ambiguities. You are welcome to stop by our poster for more discussions. Our poster number is G5. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rushil, and I'm going to be talking about CT reconstruction from a limited angle scenario. This is joint work with Hojun J, Aditya, Kyle, and Timo from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. I'm interested in CT reconstruction, but let's look at the CT imaging setup. Computer tomography is basically the use of X-rays to recover 3D structure of objects, where we pass these X-rays through the object and collect them at a detector. These sinograms are basically what the measurements are. Now, typical CT requires us to look at the object from all sides. You need 180 degree views to get the, to get the 3D structure, right? And each row in the sonogram basically corresponds to a single view of the uh, scanner. Once we have all the views, we can use existing, te existing techniques to recover very accurate structure because this is a field that's been active for about three decades. But the scenario that we're interested in is actually called a limited angle scenario. And these, there are several applications that require such a scenario. For example, when you have structural limitations, when the object that you're scanning has a weird shape that doesn't let you scan entirely, or you have temporal limitations when you're scanning dynamic events like the heart. We consider an extreme, extreme case where we only have a 90 degree viewing angle. We want to reconstruct, uh, we want to get an accurate reconstruction when we can't see over half the object. So, Naturally, this is a very highly ill-posed system, so if you use analytical techniques on this limited view uh, sinogram, you end up getting reconstructions that are highly artifact-ridden, and you can't recover edges or the uh, intensities very well. To, to, to solve this, we propose a system called CTNet, which during training basically learns to predict the final reconstruction, but at test time, we take this reconstruction and project it back into sinogram space. So this basically gives us a fictitious sinogram, which is basically ex extrapolating in the sinogram space. We then take that completed sinogram and then use existing analytical techniques to obtain the final reconstruction. With a lot of experiments, we show that this final reconstruction ends up being much more accurate in terms of PSNR and quality as the final reconstruction. We test our uh, algorithm on, uh, on real-world data where we collect 120 check, uh, luggage bags that are scanned. These are 3D scans, and each scan has about 400 slices. So we have a data set, about, data set of about 50,000 images. We use 100 bags for training and 20 bags for testing. So here are some reconstruction results. On the top row, we have ground truth. The middle row, we have a baseline called the filter back projection, which is an analytical technique. And the bottom, bo bo bottom row, we have the CT net, which is the proposed reconstruction. We see the PSNR values are roughly 5 dB higher than the baseline approaches. We also test it on 3D segmentation, where we do uh, like a real-world uh, application. On the bottom left is the proposed 
is segmentation on the proposed reconstruction. Bottom right is segmentation on a baseline reconstruction. And what we can see is that the edges are much better recovered in our reconstruction than a baseline approach. Another example of 3D reconstruction where we see that the baseline approach entirely fails to recover the relevant objects. Um, what, what is interesting to note is that our segmentation is much more closer to the ground truth and the segmentation label that we would have gotten with all the views. Now, because CT reconstruction is typically used in critical scenarios like healthcare or security, we also propose a measure of confidence of reconstruction. That is to, for a user to gauge how good the quality of reconstruction is in the absence of ground truth. And what we see in our experiments is that this, con this measure of confidence very strongly correlates to PSNR without the need for ground truth. So a practitioner can use it in the, in, in the field without actually needing to collect ground truth data. For more details, please come to our poster, number G8. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Men Yifeng from Peking University. In this talk, I will introduce our work on a common framework for interactive texture transform. These years, many methods capable of creating impressive stylized effects have been proposed, such as neural doodle, turning doodles into artworks, decoupage, and tester effects transform. However, these methods seem to be isolated from each other due to the specific use sense. In fact, they share a common notion of transferring textures under user guidance. So the aim of this paper is to establish a general framework of user-guided texture transfer for multi-task, including turning doodles into artworks, editing decorative patterns, generating tests in special effects as well as controlling effect distribution in test images and swapping textures. To accomplish this, we adapt the notion of image analog with three input images including South Semantic Map, South Stylized Image, and the Target Semantic Map the target stylized image could be automatically generated. Now, let's see the overview of our method. There are three main steps, including structure extraction, propagation, and the guided texture transfer. For structure extraction, we first perform silence detection for cell semantic map and the cell stylized image using a context-aware method. Then, source structure mask is computed by the subtraction of source silence pairs above. For structure propagation, concur key points match between source and target is forward to be performed using CPD algorithm. Then, we compute the planar transformation using simplified splice to project the structure from source to target. The structure correspondence and the target structure map are used for guided initialization and search. Our goal is to synthesize the target stylized image using texture in source. We pose this problem as a patch-based optimization task with the following energy function. Consisting of three guiding kernels, semantics, structure, and coherence. We define the semantic guidance term use LR2, uh, using L2 norm of two sampled patches in RGB space. It is the distance between the semantic maps of source and target. The same goes for other terms with patches in different images. In brief, three guiding terms with different purposes are, are introduced for dynamic guidance using changeable ways and we leverage our input patch match with the extended nearest neighbor field and the parallel search to obtain transformable cells at higher speed. With these extensions, our method can produce high quality textures with content awareness and low level details. And then there will be some results of our method.
Uh, thanks for your attention and welcome to our poster at G11. Thank you. All right, uh, this concludes the session. I would like to thank all the speakers one more time. Uh, all these po uh, papers are also presented as posters, so please feel free to stop by for further questions. Thank you. <laughs>